So welcome back. Um, we'll just continue. So we were talking about why it's important to look at culture. Any other thoughts on why is it important to consider the culture of that time or of the passage we're reading? So sometimes um, one example that's given here in our text is we might understand it from our model, like we think in a certain way. And when we read that passage, we'll understand, uh, we'll interpret that passage uh, from our way of thinking. And so we might view up something as, uh, maybe oppressive to women or something that is uh, biased in some way uh, because we've not understood what was that context what does this mean in that uh, in that age in that time and if we don't understand that then we are understanding it based on our cultural lens uh, so first of all we have to recognize that we have our culture and we have a lens through which we are viewing scripture and then scripture has its own culture so to be able to understand our own culture to be able to understand what is scripture's culture and then be able to uh, apply it to our lives take the truth from it and apply it to our lives so when we look at culture there are different uh, things that we consider to be part of every culture. Okay, so there's the political uh, environment, uh, the religious uh, practices of that culture. So um, we see, I mean, even today, this is true that a specific um, group of people, like a nation, may have their own religion. Right? So that is the predominant religion of that nation. Uh, so that influences the culture, how they operate, what they view as acceptable, what they view as unacceptable. Um, there is, uh, so there's the military, so how did uh, their uh, defense system function? Uh, we see uh, in scripture where uh, when it's talking about putting on the armor of faith, it's referring to uh, what was common to the people at that time, what they were using in battle. Right? Today, we don't go out with the same kind of things. We don't go out with arrows and bows and all of those things. So, uh, But that to them was what they were seeing. They understood that as their way of defending their country, of protecting themselves. And so understanding that scripture passage in the context of what they were familiar with. Um, there's a legal system in place. So how were legal cases judged? If we look at how Jesus was tried uh, before the Roman authorities, why was he taken to the Roman authorities? Uh, how did they tr uh, try him? But even the legal system within the Jewish thing, uh, within the uh, Jewish uh, kind of structure or the religious structure, how did it function there? And how was how can we understand Jesus' trial from that perspective of understanding how they tried cases? Was Jesus' trial fair in the first place? Uh, all of those things. So knowing what were the practices of that time to be able to understand what we're reading in a much more... Um, like in a realistic way, because the readers of that day would have read it and they would have immediately understood what was happening. But we, we come from such a different time that we don't understand the nuances that are there in those stories. And so we have to study these things. We have to look at the background. The agriculture, why does Jesus use so many examples of farmers, of sowing seeds? Because it was an agricultural society. Uh, highly dependent on agriculture for their wealth. And so uh, when he's using these examples, that is also 
something that is very common to the people. They understand what he's talking about because they are seeing it all the time. They are practicing it. Um, so uh, another thing for us to learn is Jesus was using their everyday experiences. So when we are preaching or when we are teaching, how are we using people's everyday experiences to explain scripture? Right? We can't use the same examples of agriculture. We can't use the same examples of shepherds. Because where do we ever see shepherds? Right? We don't see shepherds. We don't know what the, the way shepherds function. Why don't we understand what is a staff? What is a rod? We have to under, we go in and we study the meaning of those things because we don't see shepherds around us. We don't know what those things mean. Um, so for us also learning from Jesus's preaching style, using the things that people are seeing in their everyday lives to communicate truths. Uh, there's a social aspect, how people related to each other, what was uh, the different statuses in society, uh, also recognizing that there were so many different cultures within this Roman um, province, right? There was the Greek culture, there's the Jewish culture, um, there's the history that they have of Greeks ruling over this place. And so understanding all of those things, how do all of these people relate to each other? How do the Samaritans relate to the Greeks? All of those social structures. Um, the economy, so uh, how uh, the taxes that the Romans were collecting, uh, the temple taxes that will be collected by the, uh, by the Jews, all of those things, understanding that, understanding the architecture when they talk about how beautiful the temple is, uh, what was it that was beautiful about the temple? How did it compare to the architecture of that day? Uh, there are so many descriptions of things that were happening, Solomon's colonnade. Uh, so what was that? Where was that? Well, how was that place being used? All of those things help us better understand the context. Uh, clothing, a classic example, women covering their head. Uh, men should not wear, in the Old Testament, men should not wear women's clothes. Women should not wear men's clothes. What does that mean? All of those things. Uh, geography, so where did these things take place? Was there a sea close by? Uh, who were the people who lived there? There were fishermen. There were... Uh, there were uh, shepherds, there were Samaritans, there were Jews, there were Gentiles. Who were the people? So understanding the geography and then understanding the family and home. So uh, the father as the head of the home, um, the, uh, the most senior male member having authority. Uh, some of those things may still be part of our culture, but some things may be very different. So understanding how all of these familial relationships uh, happened and also how did the family operate. There's so much teaching in the New Testament about how husbands and wives should relate to each other, how parents should relate to uh, their children, children to parents, uh, how uh, slaves should obey their masters, all of these things that we don't see. We don't see slaves uh, in our, uh, we're not directly exposed to it. It's definitely there in existence, but we don't see it uh, in our everyday lives. So understanding all of these things and uh, then interpreting the passage based on how was it functioning in that culture. OK, uh, so uh, some of the questions we need to ask when we recognize that there is a cultural gap, there are things that were done so differently in those days than uh, is done here in our present time where we are. Uh, how do we read scriptures? Do we take everything in scripture and we just practice it exactly as scripture talks about it or uh, do we uh, do we try to differentiate between what is cultural and what is a principle that we need to still follow today uh, that is one aspect the other is how much does culture influence scripture so when we are reading scripture do we have to always be worried that there's some cultural aspect i'm missing uh, 
maybe I'm misunderstanding this passage. So how much of it is relevant just to be taken and followed? And how much of it needs to be interpreted correctly and uh, for us to differentiate between culture and what is the truth that we need to follow? Um, and then how do we determine which teachings uh, we need to transfer and which teachings we don't need to transfer? What is just a cultural thing? And what is something that is normative, something that we still need to be following today? Um, so we're going to look at a few examples from our textbook. OK, so uh, this is just a list of different verses. And we need to decide whether it's a permanent practice, that is something that we still need to follow today, or if it's temporary, that something that was followed in that culture, uh, we don't need to do the exact practice. Maybe we need to look at what was the truth underlying that practice and follow that truth. But we don't need to follow the exact practice. OK, so if it's something we don't need to follow exactly, it's considered as temporary. If it's something that we need to follow exactly, then it's a permanent practice. So um, greet one another with a holy kiss. Is that permanent or temporary? Temporary. Everyone agrees? <laughs> yeah. Online as well, please. Yeah. OK. So uh, that was a temporary practice limited to that culture, right? They uh, that was their standard way of saying hello to one another, or uh, like how some people will hug, some people will shake hands, some people will uh, fold their hands, whatever a way of showing respect, of uh, acknowledging one another, showing love towards one another. Uh, abstain from meat sacrifice to idols, temporary, permanent. OK. Temporary? OK. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other thoughts? Who all are saying temporary? Who all is temporary? OK. And permanent? OK. We'll decide when we click on this. OK. So it's a, uh, it's a permanent teaching in that uh, the truth of it is don't participate in um, in that worship of idols. Don't participate. Uh, so when uh, Paul talks about it specifically, he's saying, uh, when you eat that meat, uh, you are you may cause somebody else to fall because somebody believes that that idol is God, right? And so they believe that that there is some significance to that food. And so if you are participating in it, they believe that you are participating in their worship. So for another person who is not so strong in faith, you may be a stumbling block to them. But for yourself, you know that that idol is not God. And so when you're eating that meat, there is no significance to that meat. It's just good food. And you've prayed and you've blessed it in Jesus' name. So we understand those teachings of what is, why was he saying abstain from it is because it may cause somebody else to fall. He's not saying abstain from it because there's something wrong with the meat itself. Uh, he's, so that is the, from that perspective, it is a permanent teaching. OK, uh, be baptized. Permanent. Okay. Okay. So be baptized is permanent. Uh, wash one another's feet. Temporary, just because you don't want to do it. Or <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Wash one another's feet is temporary, limited to that culture. Uh, a way of welcoming, showing uh, respect to your guests, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, especially an act that a servant would do. So when Jesus does it, it's really like he's really lowering himself uh, to do that. Um, yes. 
goes on to say that you know if you know these things blessed are you if you do that john chapter 13 17 mm-hmm. after uh, commanding disciples to wash one another's feet mm-hmm. so is it more in relevance to you know how humble and you need to be uh, not like lord of all as a master but as a master you have to serve yes because there are uh, still some practices if i'm not mistaken like you know if i'm not sure if it's in catholic or the round or thing there are some places where they actually do that they so wash people yes uh, i don't know about like a uh, places where it's practiced regularly but i know that people do it in certain like sometimes when they are what's that i'm not sure there was one pope who had actually done that in the recent uh, okay uh, okay yeah so um i think they are taking that and like following jesus's example literally uh, which there's nothing wrong with it uh it's just to say that we don't need to start doing that all the time that doesn't need to become a regular practice within the church uh we understand what the purpose was yeah yeah so to take that truth the underlying truth and follow that so what does it mean to have the heart of a servant even though you are the leader of a certain place how do you still serve the people with that kind of humility uh, so what might that look like in your culture uh, it may be something like just carrying chairs setting them out for a meeting you don't need to do that because you're the leader but you do it because you recognize that you are also serving people so uh those kinds of things where you lower yourself you don't allow people to put you in this on this platform and always be serving you rather you uh choose to do things that will also serve others um okay any anyone else has any questions thoughts okay uh extend the right hand of fellowship permanent or temporary permanent okay uh everyone agrees on permanent everyone's a little bit confused okay so um again it's a temporary practice because uh, the principle behind it is that you warmly welcome people into your gatherings you extend love um so you uh, extend brotherly or sisterly love to people uh that is the so you do it in whatever way is um app for that culture that situation so some places uh the men and women don't shake hands so if you're saying we all have to extend the right hand of fellowship that means we all have to uh, stretch out our right hand and welcome somebody someone may not be comfortable with that right so how do we show the same kind of love and acceptance of people in a way that is culturally relevant or in that setting what is how do you express uh fellowship how do you express uh love towards one another um ordain by the laying on of hands <laughs> you want to read the passage acts 13:3 Acts thirteen three. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, so um, this is where Paul and uh, Barnabas are being sent on their first missionary journey. Before that, that's that's their commissioning or their sending out. Uh, so, any thoughts? yeah yeah uh 
Okay. Big thoughts. Anyone uh, online? Okay. So if we look at Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, we'll just open to that. Taking the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Okay, so here we see uh, laying on of hands as included in one of the basic things of our faith, right? All the other things are things we continue to believe, right? Fundament, uh, so they're saying uh, things of fundamental importance, repenting from evil deeds, placing our faith in God, uh, baptism, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, all those things are things that we continue to believe in. So laying on of hands is something we continue to follow as part of that, as something that's included as one of the fundamental practices uh, or fundamental uh, beliefs in our faith. So in that regard, it's considered as permanent. OK. Um, prohibit women from speaking in a church assembly. Temporary. OK. OK. Uh, yes, it's temporary because um, it is about that specific context that Paul was talking about, and we'll actually be looking more into it later on, so we won't go into it now, but uh, it's within the context of that church, what was going on there, all of those things that he is giving that teaching. Uh, have fixed hours of prayer. Permanent. Okay. Everyone thinks permanent. You can pray any time. Okay. What's it? It's permanent. We should also have a fixed prayer. We can pray any time, but we should also have a fixed prayer time. Yeah, so uh, the, the verse that's given here is Acts 3 1. So it says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. Okay, so they had a prayer service at three o'clock. That means, should we continue to have a prayer service at three o'clock? Is the question. Do we need to follow that practice? Okay, so uh, yeah, from a uh, perspective of discipline, and this is personal or even as an organized prayer thing, we have to have a fixed time to meet, right? If we are going to have our church service, we have to have a time. But we don't have to have 3 o'clock. We don't have to continue to follow that. Or we will have to have our church services at 3 o'clock because they had their church service at 3 o'clock. So from that, so we are taking that principle and we follow it, but we don't take the exact practice so it's temporary from that so to understand where we are following the exact practice and where we are taking something that is good like the principle or the truth and following the truth without the exact practice being followed okay so this will be temporary uh colossians 3 16 sing psalm songs hymns and spiritual songs or sing psalms permanent okay permanent okay yeah online also permanent okay yeah we continue uh, to do that in our services uh, we continue to do that uh, as part of expressing our faith to god and all based on scripture so um it is permanent. So how do we decide that something is permanent or temporary? It's not based on, OK, we are seeing it today, happening today, so it's permanent. We are not seeing it today, so it's temporary. 
we're not basing it on what we are seeing yeah we base it on what scripture says um so as uh, we look at some of the ways in which we can discern whether something should be considered as a temporary practice or something should be considered permanent uh, so a few more examples abstain from eating blood so this okay what was it thing temporary okay <laughs> what's that permanent okay and online permanent okay so um this is a little confusing because uh we earlier looked at abstain from meat sacrifice to idol abstain from eating blood is um can be considered as part of that now it's considered as temporary uh because um of how blood was viewed in that culture uh blood was viewed as carrying the life of the animal so when you uh, sacrifice the animal uh, if you're eating the blood you're kind of like consuming something that is part of their life but also uh because of health purposes uh of how it was especially in jewish culture we see that but uh so that's something uh we see in jewish culture and then acts 1529 connected to idol worship you must abstain from eating blood but eating blood separate from idol worship from sacrifices offered to idols is part of some people's diet uh so we we see when um god uh when uh, peter has the vision of all animals are clean uh the truth that's revealed in that is what you consume cannot uh in any way make you unclean right so if you're eating blood which is not sacrificed to idols then it is just something that is part of your culture that is not wrong so when we read let's just read acts 15:29 if someone can read that for us that you obtain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been stangled and from sexual immorality if you keep yourself from these you will do well fare well okay so uh this is written to uh this is the letter that's written to the gentiles because there was some teaching coming to the gentiles that they have to follow old testament law uh, they had to uh, be circumcised all of those things and then the jerusalem church writes this letter to them saying don't eat food sacrificed to idols don't drink the blood of animals don't eat strangled meat so it's in the context of uh animals that are sacrificed okay so if it's just some other animal and it's part of your diet in your culture it's a different it's not considered wrong uh, as per scripture okay slaves obey your earthly masters permanent okay okay so most countries now it's illegal to have slaves so that's one side of it but we again so we in the church how do we take this teaching what do we understand from it we understand the principle of it that as people who work for work under authority we will walk in obedience but we don't have the same practice of slavery so in that sense it's a temporary thing okay so we we won't follow the practice of slavery right within the church uh, or within our culture at least there's and i think most places it's illegal we don't follow that practice of slavery but we follow the principle of 
obeying your authority. Okay, understood that. Ephesians six five. Uh -huh. Bond servants. Uh, I understand the slavery part is no longer existing, mm -hmm. but uh, bond servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Mm -hmm. Is it like uh, a permanent fear of the master? Yeah. Like, so. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. So that that's what we are saying. Anything we're taking, we'll take that principle. So the what is the principle is reverence to Christ, who is our master, uh, and to uh, respect the authorities that he has given in our lives. So it may be our employers, whatever. But the practice of slavery is not permanent. So that is the difference. Uh, observe the Lord's Supper. Permanent. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Permanent. Thank you. Um, do not make any oaths. Permanent. Okay. Everyone agree? Online also. Do not make any oaths. Yeah. Permanent. Uh, be circumcised. Temporary, right? So these things are the ones that are simple, there's clear. So why do you all say that be circumcised is temporary? OK, Christ was circumcised on our behalf, OK? Anything like specific from scripture that you can point to? Why is being circumcised a temporary? Yeah, so scripture in the New Testament teaches that we are no longer under uh, the covenant of the law, but we are under the covenant of grace, right? We see clear teaching from even the passage we read uh, in Acts 15, where the Gentiles are being taught to, uh, some people are saying Gentiles should be circumcised, but the leaders of the church say it's not necessary for you to be circumcised. These are the only things you need to continue to follow. So right in the New Testament, it's making a change in the rule for, the, for new believers. Uh, new believers no longer need to be circumcised. They need to... Uh, but there are some certain things from the Old Testament that they still need to follow. Uh, or they, uh, there are some things that they still need to continue to practice. Um, so that is going to be one of the principles that we'll take into consideration when we are deciding whether something is cultural or something is, uh, something is temporary or something is permanent. Uh, has the New Testament said something specifically saying you no longer need to follow this? Some things we... It's like this, we already know intuitively. We know that the New Testament teaches us. We know it's a temporary thing. So uh, that's one way to discern. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Temporary. Yeah. Yes, temporary. And then cast lots for church officers. Okay, temporary. Okay, so yeah, so we know a lot of these things. We'll just look at why we consider some things as permanent, why we consider some things as temporary. What are the principles we use when we make that decision? Um, so yeah, the there are two tasks we need to decide whether. Uh, how was, how was a certain text to be looked at in that cultural setting? And what does it mean in our context today? OK, so in that culture, how were they reading the text? How were they receiving the teaching? And how does this apply to us in our context? Those are two decisions uh, when we are reading scripture, or two ways in which we look at the Bible. 
Um, so some of the principles, one is, is it repeatable? Is it something that we see continuously in scripture? Uh, so from the Old Testament to the New Testament, do we see that practice continued? Uh, do we see that it has not been anywhere revoked? So like we talked about the circumcision, it's clearly said you don't need to be circumcised in the New Testament. So that is an example of something that has been revoked or something uh, that uh, is kind of withdrawn from the things that we need to do. Okay. Then another prince, uh, so is it repeatable, continuous, or not revoked? Is it a moral or theological subject? Is it something to do with a standard of right and wrong? If it's right and wrong, like this is sin, this is not sin, then it shouldn't change, right? What was considered wrong will still be considered wrong. There's, for no reason will that change. So it's not a, is, is it something that is moral or is it theological? Something about God, something that has been revealed about God won't change over time. Right? God is one way, one time, another way, another time. Um, is it repeated elsewhere in scripture? Okay, So has it been repeated as something that is continuing to be followed in the church? in the New Testament, uh, or repeated as something that we should continue to do. Um, so some examples here. Um, Genesis 9.6. OK, we'll just read that passage, Genesis 9.6. Genesis 9.6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Thank you. Thank you. So um, that has not changed. There's no other place in scripture where it says, now you will no longer, that will no longer be the punishment for murder. Right? So if somebody takes someone else's life, the punishment is that their life will be taken. Um, now, this is also up to the justice system of that country. So the country may decide that they're not doing capital punishment or that they, they're doing lifetime imprisonment, whatever it may be. But scripture's teaching is a life for a life. If you've taken someone's life, your life is the payment for that crime, uh, will be the punishment. OK, um, polygamy to monogamy. So in the Old Testament, we see that we don't see it in Genesis. We see Adam had was uh, Eve was made for Adam. But after that, the cultural practice was that there were multiple wives for one person, one man had multiple wives. That was part of the cultures of the surrounding, and people started to follow that. Um, but in the New Testament, it's clearly taught that you should only have one wife. There's no uh, no teaching on you can stay faithful to all your wives. You shouldn't divorce any of your wives, right? It's uh, there's only one wife, and you shouldn't divorce. Once you've come together, you have become one. So there's no possibility of then becoming one with somebody else. Uh, so based on New Testament teaching, we don't follow polygamy, OK? Um, Nazarite was led to grow his hair. So in the Old Testament, um, we see that some people who were specially set apart for God uh, were uh, asked not to cut their hair. So Samson uh, was asked not to cut his hair. Uh, and um, John the Baptist also actually was somewhat like a Nazarite, the similar commandments to what was given to Samson. Um, but again, in 1 Corinthians 11, we see that long hair is considered dishonorable. So how do we understand that? How do we interpret that? So we understand that in the Old Testament where it was written, it was because of that 
culture that it was written in. Also in the New Testament, it was because of the culture in which it was written. Okay, in both places, it was, uh, if you, uh, there's no command to grow your hair. Uh, and the long hair example is used uh, more from the context of covering their head and that kind of uh, explanation that Paul gives. So when we are looking at the covering of the head, we look more in detail at, uh, at that. But basically, no, not everyone has to grow their hair. And uh, long hair, again, is dependent on what is your definition of long hair. But uh, it was in relation to the covering of the head. OK? Um, so we ask, as uh, these are two questions to ask when we are deciding if something is a cultural practice or a permanent practice. Uh, ask if it has been revoked or replaced by some other teaching. OK, so now we're not going to say all men have to grow their hair because you are all going to serve God now. So you all have to grow your hair long. OK, so the Nazarite, uh, because the Nazarites in the Old Testament, were, we don't say that because we don't see that being commanded in the New Testament. Um, and then what was the last command on the topic? So those are two things we'll ask. OK. Uh, I think we can uh, stop here. We still have, we have some stuff left, but we can continue. But are there any questions, any thoughts? If it is without the scriptural reference, the mindset and the thinking goes in a different pattern. But yeah. With those scriptural references, then uh, you really tend to understand it's temporary. Or, uh, yes. Yes. So reading the actual verse in the Bible, looking at what was the context within it, uh, which it was written, is very important. Yeah. OK. Uh, Sanjay had also shared on circumcision. Paul called for circumcision of the heart. Uh, that is a spiritual circumcision, yeah. OK, so there's no other questions. We'll take a break and come back uh, at 11. This is Lucy, you said you're still not able to view. Uh, would another student? be able to help Lucy with that, please. OK, so I'll keep the chat open, uh, but I'll just end the class for now. Thank you all for being here. Thanks.